Okay, we're going to talk today about uh, tropical infections and travel-related infections. So every year there's about 15 million travelers overseas. Half of them go to developed countries. Most get no sound advice, and many do not take proper prophylaxis. Um, so we're going to try to understand the pitfalls when traveling, sound advice to travelers, and what are your hazards, and what are your resources. So here's some facts. Uh, about 70% of people report some health problems while traveling. 8% actually will seek medical care overseas. Uh, half a percent will actually need emergency care, which is about 15,000, and 1 in 100,000 will die while traveling. And what is the role of infectious disease in all of this? So what are the threats? Well, obviously there's jet lag, lack of oxygen, DVTs, airplane travel, taxi cabs, notorious trauma. That's one of the biggest ones. Diarrhea, dysentery, hepatitis A, typhoid from eating the food and water. Bites, mosquitoes, and animal bites are issues. Crime is another one. And revolution. So um, access to travelers risk. Uh, you want to get a typical history. Pregnancy is important. What's your prior immunization, your allergies? All those are questions to ask. Now all of these diseases are potential there, but the risk is low for most of them, higher for others. So you have to decide what's the risk of this and should I prevent it and how. So um, hepatitis A is the most common infection. So of all the things you should get vaccinated for, hep A is number one on the list. It's 1 in 50 to 1 in 350 of becoming infected, and the vaccine is available. And so that is the most important vaccination. Malaria is number two. There's over 1,000 cases in the US per year. There's no vaccine, so you have to take prophylaxis. Hepatitis B depends on your duration of travel and if you're becoming sexually active in the uh, country you're going to. All of these are questions on whether Hep B vaccination is necessary, one in a thousand. Typhoid fever, rare, but does occur, one in three thousand. Cholera, also very rare, depends on when you go and if there's outbreaks like the Haiti outbreak. Yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis have incredibly bad morbidity mortality associated with it. So even though they're rare, if you get it, it's not a good outcome. So vaccinations are possible. Less exotic infections, easily preventable, obviously tetanus, diphtheria, polio, measles, rubella, the flu shot, and strep pneumo. These are all questions on traveling. Should I get these vaccines? Somewhat preventable is traveler's diarrhea. Well, there's ways you can do that. Taking Cipro is not necessarily recommended. Rifaximin is a way of doing it. A lot of people I know, though, do take Cipro in case they get sick, but there's no data that says that's helpful. And, of course, you can come back with a cold, which is probably quite common. Arthropod assault. I like that name. Bug bites. Okay. Uh, malaria can be obtained. Dengue. Chicken gunya fever. You should all know that. It's the dengue look-alike. Uh, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile virus, filariasis. Actually, you would have to live there for a year and get thousands of mosquito bites to get elephantiasis or filariasis. So you could get it, but not likely, okay? Uh, continuing on that, Leishmania with sand flies, Oncocerca is the black flies. Sleeping sickness does occur in travelers, the tsetse fly. Water exposure, if you go swimming in the rivers or the lakes, schistosomiasis can occur. Uh, leptospirosis, that's a big one, uh, the venture vacations. Amoebic encephalitis, you can get that in Florida, Texas, Georgia, so you don't have to travel, but it does occur in other countries. Uh, stinging jellyfish, corals, etc. Drowning does occur, especially with alcohol intoxication. Other threats. Altitude sickness, uh, deep vein thromboses, heat stroke and exhaustion, drowning, uh, psych illnesses and stress, and no way to pay for medical care unless you bought insurance when you traveled. This is an old slide, but it brings up the idea if you were traveling to Thailand, what would be your number one concern? Diarrhea would dominate, then respiratory, then malaria, hepatitis, interesting gonorrhea was up there too. Uh, this is a nice way of looking at probability. 
the most common thing you're going to get is diarrhea followed by malaria and a cold or respiratory illness and malaria is only if you went to West Africa as far as that high at risk and then notice hep A and then you get dengue and then it really starts dropping so the chances of you getting meningococcal meningitis is extremely low compared to the other things. So what are the common causes of fever after tropical travel? The first thing everyone thinks of is malaria. You should also think of respiratory, diarrhea, dengue, typhoid, rickettsias. Those are very frequently forgotten, rickettsial illnesses, so you have to know what they are around the world. Uh, interesting, you can break it down into what if you get a fever with a short incubation within a week of travel? There's a whole lot of things. What if your fever occurs a month later? Well, there's another thing to think about. What about if your fever occurred over three months after you return? So, you know, depending on when your fever occurred, your differential may change. So if you look at some of the ways of looking at the world, global pro poverty is blown up in Africa and Asia pro prominently. The global wealth, we all know, is in Europe, United States, and Asia, Japan, India has a lot of wealth. And then where do all the tourists want to go? Well, they like to go to Mexico, U.S., Europe is big, and parts of Asia are also big. All right? And then where are all the people using up the water? U.S. is a big water user. Uh, what about where's the resources? The Amazon River, South America is very large. And how much rainfall? Interesting, Africa gets a lot, as does South America. And if you look at infections, you can break them down into when people die in different countries, there's low income, middle income, and high income. And you can break them down into the young, the middle age, and the elderly. So if you look at Africa, for example, kids dying from zero to four, dominating, followed by East Mediterranean, Southeast Asia. When you get into 15 to 59 year olds, again, Africa is dominating Europe and Southeast Asia. Uh, if you look at low income countries, the top killers are pneumonia, heart attacks, diarrhea, AIDS, stroke, then TB, neonatal infections, malaria, and prematurity. If you look at high income countries, the only infection is pneumonia at number four. All of the others are non-infectious diseases. And then um, when you look at um, disability adjusted life years, if you kill uh, the young, you tend to have a high disability adjusted life year than if you die of a stroke at 80. So obviously pneumonia, diarrhea, HIV are killing young people, so they have high levels of disability adjusted life years. And then um, another way of looking at the map of all the killers you can see uh, how people die, half of them die over 60, but the young 0 to 4, there's a large piece of the pie of people dying at that age. In high income countries, 0 to 14 year olds don't die very common, whereas in Africa, 45% of deaths are 0 to 14, so there's a major discrepancy there. And then if you look at age of death, again, Africa dominating versus the high income. And then if I look at extremes here by sex, uh, you can see injuries. Males are more likely to die of an injury than a female. Overall, they're fairly common. And then when you look at um, different things broken down between males and females, interesting, cardiovascular was in females infections a little bit more in males and cancer a little bit more in males unintentional injuries highly in males over females and then when you look at child mortality you can see in Africa for example the top killers are diarrhea pneumonia malaria and perinatal conditions so that's what they're dying of primarily and then if you broke it down into um, countries by death in the child deaths you can see by the illustration of people that Africa is dominating with HIV malaria pneumonia notice that measles is also a big killer that's a big area of concern and then um, when we say we have neonatal deaths what are they really dying of they're dying of prematurity birth asphyxiation neonatal infections 
uh, diarrhea, neonatal tetanus, 3.4%. So these are all preventable kind of things, or some of them are. So you can see um, that's a big concern. And then um, when you look at cause of de death between high income uh, countries and lower, you can see Africa has a lot more communicable and nutritional deaths than, say, high income countries. And then another way of looking at it in Africa, you can see injuries, HIV, and um, other infectious parasitic disease, ma maternal nutritious, nutritional conditions dominating. Um, if you map things out into years of life loss, so if you lose young people, you have a high amount of years of life lost as opposed to an elderly person. So you can see Africa, Southeast Asia is on the exact opposite extreme of high income Americas. And then again, if you look at diseases, if you die of pneumonia, diarrhea, HIV, neonatal conditions, it's different than when you die of stroke and heart attacks at an old age when you're considering years of life lost. And then years of life disability and disability adjusted life years, you could see in Africa, those numbers are quite disproportional to the rest of the world. And when you look at burden of disease by broad categories, again, Africa, the communicable maternal perinatal nutritional is way overrepresented, followed by Eastern Mediterranean and Southeast Asia. And then when you look at age distribution of uh, diseases between high and low income, you can see that when you get to that 0, 4 piece of the pie, dramatic differences and even in the 5 to 14. And when you look at the leading cause of death in the middle years, okay, you can see that, again, um, where do they put most of the illnesses? They're putting a lot of stress on psychiatric illnesses. HIV is getting a lot of attention. TB, and then as they keep going down, you're getting a lot of psych issues are becoming a world problem they're working on. Um, and then you look at burden of disease in women, HIV, TB, especially in Africa, uh, neuropsych conditions, injuries, maternal nutritional conditions, again, high in Africa. And then burden of injuries, disability adjusted life years, poisoning, falls, fires, they're cooking right in their house, fires falling into the fire, suicide, violence, war, you can see that in some places they're quite high depending on how you look at the piece of the pie. This is uh, interesting is that what is the predictions for 2020 and 2030? They're predicting that malaria deaths, TB and HIV will drop and stroke, heart attacks and cancers are going to grow higher as people's health improves. And another way of looking at it is projections, not dramatic changes for high income. For low income, there's some pretty dramatic changes going on uh, if these projections hold true. And then who knows why um, diarrhea is going to go from number two to out of the top 20. Rotavirus vaccine, right? So diarrhea is going to drop dramatically. Pneumonia and other infections will go down. Things like diabetes, COPD, those are going to increase stroke, heart attacks by 2030. Now, if we think of HIV, you've all seen the maps. Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia dominate. Some countries uh, like uh, Haiti, Central America, you can see a lot of HIV rates. If you follow the HIV epidemic, you would know that it was on the increase in the 90s and by the 2000s it started to level off. And when you look at prevalence of HIV, you can see Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest amount of HIV. If you were to look at a map, where is all your HIV? Uh, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia dominates the world. People dying of HIV, the same places are quite heavily represented. Where do physicians want to work? Well, unfortunately, Africa is highly underrepresented. So there's a major physician shortage in Africa. Everybody wants to come to the United States to work or in Europe. And China, Japan, and India have a lot of physicians. And then when you look at um, HIV, you have to look at children orphaned by AIDS. All of these are questions that have 
uh, been addressed because um, who's taking care of these people usually the family is if you look at the numbers Southeast Asia and and, and sub-Saharan Africa are dominating if you look at the countries with the highest HIV rates you can see all of them are in South our sub-Saharan Africa and when you look at uh, the map again most of the adults and children come from those two parts of the world children dying of HIV same locations very high numbers a number of children living with HIV again sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia dominates and newly infected children the numbers also high in those areas and then how many children are dying less than 15 high numbers in Africa and Southeast Asia and if you look at different parts of the world at clinics you can see uh, different changes over time like in India uh, you can see changes in the clinics where IV drug users may come and then over time in Thailand there's maybe some leveling off of the epidemic and if you look at the Philippines you can also see uh, changes in the epidemic over time Bangladesh Pakistan uh, when you look at Ukraine the IV drug use is very high in Russia and Ukraine and Eastern Europe so that's driving the epidemic at high levels and then uh, Latin America you can see countries in Latin America with different levels of HIV looking at different populations and then um, how many HIV infections occur per day these numbers change every year but you can see that uh, it's quite high even in children and then globally how many HIV deaths are occurring in children these are some of the numbers you can get from the UN AIDS group people living with HIV AIDS death and then a regional statistics even in North America you can look at them from every country on your own well when they look at HIV rates they look at neonatal antenatal clinics women attending you can see leveling off in some countries HIV is decreasing uh, if you look at the female to male breakdown HIV is very high in the female population versus the male and you can see that a lot of the countries are represented in sub-saharan Africa 15 to 24 year old uh, children with HIV is declining and ch children dying of HIV is declining and the number of adults and deaths due to AIDS globally has declined after a peak and one of the big reasons are the availability of antiretroviral therapy the more that that's being used in an area the death rate is dropping number of people getting HIV in low and middle income uh, over the world you can see dramatic increases and when you look at coverage you see some countries don't do a very good job and others are doing a much better job so you can look at it based on countries now that's HIV from a global perspective what about tuberculosis where is most of the tuberculosis in the world sub-saharan Africa India Southeast Asia Russia and uh, interesting Brazil and if you want to know from where is all the TB Africa and Asia dominates in Eastern Europe and if you want to know what's the top 10 TB uh, infected countries all of them are in sub-saharan Africa and malaria that's another epidemic to be concerned about where's most of your malaria all of them are in Africa except India is on the map so we got three major illnesses sub-saharan or Africa is dominating um, this is your malaria distribution where the equator is so you can see a lot of malaria in those areas and there's a lot of interesting articles about how epidemics meet each other like the TB epidemic meets the HIV epidemic which meets the malaria epidemic and how does that affect it um, you get a lot of resistance of malaria chloroquine in all of these countries here so you have to use non chloroquine drugs when people die of malaria where are they at Africa is dominating majorly uh, when you look at uh, World Health Organization working on malaria eradication they have different levels of control versus elimination in all of those areas 
and this is the estimated incidence. You can see Africa, Papua New Guinea um, has a lot of malaria, Sub-Saharan Africa, again, and estimated malaria per thousand population. So if you think of malaria, remember the bad one is falciparum. The one that can get into your liver and be delayed is Vivax and Ovali. And uh, remember the red cells may rupture all at once and giving you the classic fever pattern. Most of the time they rupture intermittently and your fever is all the time. But once you get into a pattern, you might get quotient, quotient malaria, Vivax ovale, tertian malaria, and quartan malaria. And then you need to know plasmodium nolesii. That's going to be on your board. So here's a fever pattern giving you the different bugs and what it may eventually work its way to. So the periodicity of malaria fevers. So the classic malaria is fevers, chills, dominating, headache, muscle pain. You may have a liver spleen a third of the time, enlarged, and even nausea and vomiting is there. Uh, for falciparum, um, you can die within 48 hours. So that's a major problem. And then most cases that we see tend to be falciparum, which is the most deadly one. And you can't count on chloroquine working. Even in Haiti, there's some chloroquine resistance going on. If your paracetamol is over 5%, there's a greater mortality. So this is a typical view of what a falciparum malaria patient would look like. And of course, uh, you come in anemic as well as uh, the hemolysis giving you this jaundice black water fever. Your urine is black from the hemolysis, so that's why they call it black water fever. Uh, if you develop cerebral malaria, almost guaranteed you will die, especially if not treatment. More common in kids, and you may have brain damage if you survive, and you may have seizures. So this is the brain with falciparum malaria, where the bug is sludging in the capillaries of the brain. This is a kid with falciparum malaria. <coughs> You get low glucose, which is a challenge. You get severe anemia, incredibly low hemoglobins. You go into ARDS, your kidneys fail. Low sodium, you may have a low temperature. And pregnancy is a big issue with malaria, and you may get dehydrated quite easily. Now, Vivax ovale, remember um, this one gets into the liver, so you have to use Primaquin. And you can still die of this one, but it usually is not as deadly as falciparum, okay? And then malaria tends to be a mild disease, low levels of parasites. Remember, it affects the kidneys and gives you glomerulonephritis and nephrotic syndrome. And then this one is guaranteed on your boards, which is a macaque monkey. Malaria is now getting into humans called nolesii. And it looks just like malaria, except the parasite burden can be as high as falciparum, making it more deadly than malaria, and it may be confused with malaria. The good news is you can actually use chloroquine for it. So how do you diagnose it? You do a thin and thick smear, and you want to do um, looking for the parasites as well as the morphology. And this is how to do those smears. And then this would be multiple parasite rings, obviously a falciparum, multiple parasites, likely a falciparum. Nowadays we have rapid detection kits. We can do a quick little blood test and determine um, if you are positive for certain malaria. So here's a falciparum, here's a Vivax, so you can do this. And it's quite cheap, so you can take it with you, go into a malaria endemic area, and check people by finger stick if they have malaria. Now, malaria in pregnancy is a whole topic in and of itself because they're immunosuppressed, they get a severe course, they get complications, miscarriages, and how do you treat malaria? Which ones are safe? Which ones should you avoid when you're pregnant? So these are major questions when treating malaria in pregnancy. So this is falciparum, multiple red cells parasitized. That's about a 30% parasitemia. That's the classic banana-shaped gametocyte, which is only found with falciparum. That's what you want to look for. That is a child with cerebral malaria, as is this. And there's the brain sludging with the malaria. 
Now that's a Mirozoite, and you're looking for Schuffner's dots. Those little red dots are Schuffner's dots, so you know that's Vivax ovale. And that is the nephrotic syndrome from Plasmodium malariae. Okay, and Plasmodium malariae looks like the planet Saturn with a band across it. And this is your red cells on scanning electron micrograph hemolyzing. So um, how do you control malaria? Well, you can get rid of the mosquitoes. You can vaccinate, but there is none readily available. They're still working on that. And of course, you can take prevention therapy. Uh, your chances of malaria are as low as 1 in 10,000 in Central America to as high as 1 in 30 in the Oceania area in Sub-Saharan Africa. So your risk depends on where you go. Um, malaria is the most common etiology diagnosed in returning travels with a fever. It's highest in Sub-Saharan Africa and then Asia or America. Falciparum is most common and usually they did not take chemoprophylaxis or they didn't take it correctly. So these are all the drugs you can take for chemoprophylaxis. Our favorite is malarone, followed by doxycycline, followed by mefloquin, and if you go to Haiti you can use chloroquine. And then of course using repellents are very important. So that will prevent dengue, yellow fever, malaria, etc. and avoiding um, the mosquitoes and some people even sleep in insecticide impregnated bed nets. That's another integral part. So you want to make sure you have the DEET preparation. D-E-E-T has the most effective way of getting rid of the uh, mosquitoes. Now, the chances of you getting meningococcal meningitis is rare, but there is a belt in Africa where epidemics occur. You could get it during the dry season there or during the Hajj pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. So this would be uh, a brain infected with meningococcal meningitis with the meningeal enhancement, petechial purpuric, and DIC pattern with ultimately purpura fulminans requiring amputation of the hands and feet. And that is the location where meningitis is most likely to be acquired, excuse me, with mass gatherings and vaccinations are are required or recommended. By the way, besides meningococcus, there's also strep pneumonia meningitis is occurring in the meningitis belt of Africa. So here's the Africans lining up for their vaccinations when there are big time meningitis outbreaks. And it occurs during the Harmattan when the Sahara Desert for two to three months blows all this sandy stuff and dries out your nasopharynx. And this is what the air and the eye sight would look like for several months, so you can understand how things would dry out easy in your nasopharynx. Now, another illness, break bone fever, okay, and that would be what? Dengue, right? So dengue is um, traveling along the equator, spread by Aedes aegypti, the same as yellow fever. So this would be your dengue kind of map. And remember, there's four serotypes. If you get infected the second time with a different serotype, you can get dengue hemorrhagic fever. There's about 100 million cases a year. Um, most people are actually asymptomatic. However, uh, the illness uh, becomes more severe and acute as in adults as opposed to children. The mortality is low, but it's still there with dengue, especially with the hemorrhagic fever. So here's your 80s aegypti mosquito. And um, some people say your fever pattern may look like a saddle, sort of off and on, two febrile patterns with a short interval of afebrile for one to three days. Headaches, the breakbone fever due to the back, the backache, the joint pain, the rash, um, the eye pain, nausea, vomiting. You may get vascular uh, permeability changes. The capillaries are fragile, so you get these petechiae and then you can have rapid deterioration with dehydration and then uh, ultimately GI bleeding can occur as you start to get very easily able to, ble to bleed due to the um, hemorrhagic manifestations. You may get large ecchymosis versus the small petechiae and then that sandpaper kind of rash is dengue and there's the petechiae especially downstream from a tourniquet and that is used as the tourniquet test sign with petechiae developing after you put on the tourniquet. 
So the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. Eventually you can get back your antibody or PCR test. And then there is no treatment except supportive care and don't give them aspirin. Steroids are controversial, but nobody has jumped on the bandwagon wholeheartedly. And then, of course, we have black water vomit, so that's yellow fever, right? So yellow fever also spread by the Aedes aegypti, and there is a live vaccine you can get for that. However, if you're over 65, it can be dangerous. People have died from it, so you may have to make sure you have no comorbid problems if you're over 65. Notice yellow fever seems to spare Asia, and it's mostly in the Americas and Africa. And if you want to know where most of your cases are occurring, you can see it's in Africa and South America with a few cases in the Caribbean and Central America. And then yellow fever is found in the jungle, but it's making its way into the suburbs and the cities. And then, of course, we have another mosquito-borne illness, which is Japanese encephalitis. This one gives you those choreoathetoid movements which are characteristic of Japanese encephalitis. And that's spread uh, by the Culex anopheles mosquito. And the vaccine is inactivated, so you can get your JE vaccine. And it stretches from India to Japan. By the way, who needs a JE vaccine is a whole topic in and of itself. If you're going near a pig farm out in the country, in those areas, you need a JE vaccine. If you're not, you have to really think about what's my risk, okay? So for the boards, someone's going to be going to a pig farm out in those areas. That's a JE vaccine because it likes to cycle around the farm animals and the humans are incidental hosts. So that's where you're going to find the most mosquitoes with the JE. And then the mos these mosquitoes breed in all these areas, so they try to eradicate standing water. Now, who knows what she's doing? She's treating bed nets, right, with insecticide. It lasts about a year. It costs one dollar, and you put your bed net up, and it keeps all the mosquitoes away, hopefully, which spread all the diseases that we just mentioned. So bed nets are big deals. In fact, uh, they actually track children that slept under bed nets, whether they were treated or not. You can see which countries do a good job and which ones do a bad job using the bed nets. Now, if you get in the life cycles, the one thing you want to remember is which malaria goes to the liver. The answer is the Vivax ovale, so that one needs the primary red cell erythrogenic cycle, but it needs the primaquin for the liver phase, otherwise you get a relapse. By the way, you can have falciparum and Vivax at the same time. So uh, we treated one guy who had definite falciparum, and he relapsed two or three months later, so he probably also was co-infected with Vivax or Ovali. Uh, so remember, falciparum, the most dangerous, can go to the brain, pulmonary edema, kidney failure. Why do you get such high parasitemia? It infects all ages of red cells, that's why. And then um, that's the cases where African, 75% of African children account for the mortality of that. We used to have a lot of it in the U.S., and of course now it's people who travel to other countries. Remember, falciparum has no liver stage and um, the banana-shaped gametocyte. Remember the Vivax ovale? The Schuffner's dots, the low parasitemia, it likes the liver, and it infects red cells. So that's why that are young, not the middle or older ones. That's why you get lower parasitemia. Don't forget, malaria has the band form, the nephrotic syndrome, glomerular nephritis, the low parasite level, and it only infects the old red cells. And then the symptoms um, include even as much as cough, where we don't think of malaria. And then the signs include large liver, spleen, anemia, and coma, and then the thin and thick smear travel to an endemic area. Uh, when you want to compare the four, falciparum, vivax, ovale, malaria, remember the liver stage for vivax, ovale. We don't tend to separate vivax or ovale. And then what is a poor prognosis? High parasitemia, seizures, coma, low glucose, acidosis, all of these things are bad news 
and higher mortality. And then when you look at the uh, actual forms, notice Schuffner dots are vivax ovale, and then the banana-shaped gamenocyte is falciparum when you're studying the difference. We don't recommend that you fumigate your house like this, but this is one way to get rid of mosquitoes. <laughs> And then, of course, remember the DEET and the amount of DEET concentration you'll get. These are all the products you can use for insect repellents. And the DEET percent, 10 percent, uh, is recommended. And don't give it to kids um, because they can have problems with absorption. Um, and then people actually assess how well uh, these drugs work for malaria prevention, how convenient they are, how much cost, how you tolerate them. I told you that malarone, doxy, mefloquine, chloroquine, those are the sort of ones you want to use. Now, those are the common stuff. This is the stuff you don't think about. So here's a guy that went to Africa, and he's got this classic fever pattern, and his peripheral smear shows squiggly lines. So what does he have? He has relapsing fever, Borreliosis, right? Tick-borne versus louse-borne. So relapsing fever, you can get this in your travels. We've seen that, where the Borrelia uh, gets into the body through a tick bite, whereas a louse usually would be affecting homeless people, people in refugee camps. And um, you want to look for those spirochetes in the peripheral blood, and they can have all kinds of multi-organ system treatment is uh, penicillin or doxycycline. Now what do you get with your skin and soft tissue in the tropics? What is that rash? Tinea corporis. And you see that a lot in the dogs and cats running around so the humans can get it from the pets. And then you can get tinea capitis. Now if you get a, an aberrant granulomatous response to tinea in your beard or your scalp, we call that what? A carry-on. So a carry-on is a dermatophyte infection of the scalp or beard with an aberrant immune response and may get secondary bacterial infection, more common in the African race. How about this occurs when you're hot and sweaty, intertriginous areas, satellite lesions, Canada inner trigo. This one is jock itch, so that would be tinea curris, the scallop border central clearing. And then this one's not getting better with antifungals. So you get out your woods lamp, shine it on there, and it gives you coral pink fluorescence. So you have what? Erythrasma caused by Cronibacterium minotissimum, renamed Arcanobacterium minotissimum. Treatment is a macrolide. And then, of course, herpes can occur in the genital area. These are acyclovir resistant herpes cases and perianal herpes and lip herpes, usually in HIV patients. Now, <clears throat> still talking skin and soft tissue, what about these little holes in your feet walking with flip-flops or sandals and the flea cannot jump high so it drills into your toes and feet. So what's that called? There it is laying eggs under your toenail. So that's called Tunga penetrans. You can get secondary tetanus, gangrene, staph strep infections, and look like that. Okay? Tunga penetrans. There is the flea on the bite, on the biopsy of the skin. And if you dig it out, you can't treat it, you dig them out. There's the flea. Okay? So Tunga penetrans. It's also found in all kinds of animals, and it's a sand flea, sandy terrain. If you um, sit in the area, you can actually get it in your perineum buttocks, and that's um, another location you can see it. Heavy infestations, you can get everything from gangrene to requiring amputations. What if a bug bites you, lays an egg under your skin, and within a week something is moving under your skin, and you pull out... That's a bot fly blow fly. You pull out a maggot, so that's called myiasis. Okay, so here's your life cycle of myiasis, which occurs in Central South America and Africa primarily. Uh, in in the in Florida, for example, it's mostly in 
cows, horses, and rarely in humans. You can even buy medical maggots, by the way, put on wounds. Now, this guy slept on a um, sand pile, and he's itching like crazy, so what does he have? And this was in the Amazon in Brazil. He has cutaneous larva migraines from the dog and cats defecating in the sand. So that's the typical squiggly line of cutaneous larva migraines. And the treatment is usually ivermectin works the best or albendazole. And usually it's the feet because uh, we're walking in the sand, especially at the beach. Um, there's a lot of that because the dogs run around the beach there. So dogs, cats defecating the sand. Also pigs, goats, horses defecating. And then you get their uh, hookworms. Okay, these are all cutaneous larva migraines, and it likes around the toes. It'll go away if you don't treat it. If you take some albendazole, ivermectin, mabendazole, it might go away. And then um, this is sort of the life cycle where the filiform larva is drilling into your skin there. And then um, when you travel, if something bits you and you get this linear pattern that's consistent with bed bugs, which is Cymex lectularis. They do not spread disease, although they have been cultured and were positive for MRSA. So they brings up a question of whether you could get MRSA from them. They like the inseams around the mattresses and in the walls. So bed bugs are a concern. And then um, surgery in other countries as well in the US, you can see wounds that look very nodular liposuction there was an outbreak going to Dominican Republic for cheaper liposuction breast implants cheaper surgery pedicures uh, those all can cause nodular lesions caused by what bug the rapidly growing mycobacterium which includes fortuitum chelonii and abscesses and then you may encounter people that walk barefooted farming for a living they have these large draining sinus tracts and if you amputate the leg it's eating up the leg over 10 years almost and it has sulfur granules splendor hopefully phenomenon where it meets the white cells and that's called madura foot or mycetoma could be due to a soil bacteria or a mold and it's usually in males than females and it likes the feet more than other parts of the body 20 to 50 year old and depending on the cause, you treat it with antibiotics or antifungals in surgery. You might see a lot of lumpy jaw. That's caused by what? Actinomycoses. Okay, sulfur granules, gram-positive filamentous rods, molar tooth colonies. So lumpy jaws occurs in horses, cows, and humans. So that can occur in the United States, but you might see it more overseas. Uh, how about walking barefoot and getting this verrucous kind of pattern to your skin there, hyperpigmentation, granulomas with the medlar bodies. So that would be chromoblastomycosis. That's another sub-Q mycosis that you'll encounter in patients over there. And you want to look for the medlar bodies and treat it with antifungal azoles usually. And then uh, the other one is a large ulcer after traumatic inoculation from a stick or soil pigmented septated hyphae clears nicely with antifungals and that's pheohyphomycosis and uh, this one is also traumatically inoculated into the sub-Q tissues the dark walled dematiaceous fungi and you treat it with the azoles how about uh, this one which causes swelling of the testicles urinating pure chyle lymphatic juice and it looks like that so that would be filariasis eventually it presents with elephantiasis due to obstruction of the lymphatics and then what makes it pathogenic is a bacteria that's a commensal and lives inside of it a symbiote what's its name begins with a W Wolbachia right and if you take doxycycline you kill the Wolbachia so this is what uh, elephant, you'd have to have thousands of mosquito bites. You also get secondary strep infections, which exacerbate the lymphatic obstruction. So it's a vicious cycle and multiple reasons to get ultimately elephantiasis. 
The classic one is Wuchraria bancrofti. Now, um, this is what can happen over time with elephantiasis. And uh, the treatment is usually diethylcarbamazine or ivermectin. Filariasis. The doxycycline actually treats, the, prevents the recurrent strep infections and it kills the Wolbachia. Now, this looks like elephantiasis, as does this, as does this, as does that, and this. But it's actually not a parasite. It's from living in a silica-rich soil, volcanic soil. And who knows, how do you prevent this? You wear shoes. Okay, so this is called podoconiosis. It's not a filaria. It's found in countries that have a lot of silica soil and it gets in through the skin so if you wear shoes you can prevent podoconiosis it's people walking around barefooted in that red clay kind of soil and the particles the silica get in there so how do you prevent podoconiosis shoes okay so distributing shoes is a big way to get rid of podoconiosis and if you want to know where most of your podoconiosis is you can see the map for yourself now, what kind of worm was slated for eradication in 2000, then 2010, now 2020? This is called guinea worm, okay, or the thread worm. You have to grab it and roll it on a stick one inch per day for 30 days and get it out. If you pull it too fast, you break it off, you get abscesses up the leg, and you stick their foot in a bucket of water to make the diagnosis come back 30 minutes later. The worm will be sticking out because it knows it's in water it's trying to lay eggs and you grab it and then roll it on a stick so that's called guinea worm you can see where most of it is located it's also called the thread worm because it looks like a thread and you roll it up on a stick that's what it would look like you can tie it with a string so it doesn't go back in and don't pull it too hard if you snap it off it dies and you get abscesses you can also have it up your leg and in your abdomen but mostly it's the legs and if you stick your foot in a bucket of water it'll come out and you grab it and you roll it on a stick until all of it eventually comes out so that's the life cycle of the guinea worm so how do you prevent it you filter the water so they don't drink the copepod and tell people don't go in the water when they have ulcers on their legs which is hard to do because every day they go to the water and they stand in the water to get their water and therefore the life cycle is easy to maintain. Now if you're handling fish, chickens, or any other kind of seafood, you get a purple violaceous cellulitis. So what's that? Erysipeloid, erysipelothrix rhusiopathy. What if you're cleaning out your fish tank? Reef rash. Mycobacterium marinum, right, can give you a sporotrichoid pattern. Mycobacterium marinum, global problem. How about um, fingernail infections right on the edge of them? Actually, not the nail. That's called a perinichia. And if it's in the pulp space, it's called a felon. So those are the terms there. And then you have to drain these. They're usually staph aureus. That's a global problem. Uh, you can also see, of course, herpetic whitlow. And impetigo is a big problem in the tropics. Lots of impetigo. When you go to the tropics, that honey-crusted appearance, you'll see a lot of impetigo, which could be treated with topical or oral antibiotics. You'll also see a lot of punched-out skin ulcers following bug bites, and that's called ekthyma due to group A strep, ekthyma. And then lots of fur uncles also occur in that hot, moist environment. Uh, community acquired MRSA does occur in other countries, but is not necessarily as high as we have here. Furuncles and carbuncles. So when a furuncle coalesces, you get carbuncles that look like that. Also, this is a usually a tropical uh, problem, which is pyomyositis, pus in the muscle. Uh, you see that in the tropics, Staph aureus, usually the young, the quads, and the gluteus. And then, of course, there's lots of animal contact. So if the cat bites you, you get Pastorella multocida, even the big cats. And then the worst bites are in the fingers because of the tendon sheaths. 
And then pastorella is the big one, and it occurs very quickly, so they all get prophylaxed with cat bites. Dog bites, uh, you want to worry about pastorella in 60%, but also capnocyte aphasia, cane amorsis, if you have no spleen, and those can be fatal. And then human bites or fights with the fist, iconella, and anaerobic strep. And then, of course, monkey bites, especially around temples. You want to worry about herpes B or herpes simiae. And then rat bites. If you get bit by a rat, you can get rat bite fever, which is streptobacillus monoformis in the U.S. and spirillium minor in Asia. So those are the two causes of rat bite fever, and they're all treated with penicillins. Alligator bites, leeches. We want to think of Aramonas hydrophila. Okay. And then um, all bites, you want to worry about rabies, right? So raccoons, skunks, coyote, foxes, bats in the U.S. And if you look at the rest of the world, dogs tend to dominate, but there's other animal bites, including bats and others that you may see. And then, of course, tetanus is another concern uh, whenever you have any bite injury, uh, and that is the sardonic smile and opisthotness. And this is the sardonic smile lock jaw. And that is the subterminal spore of tetanus. Now this is a kid in Africa who literally is not smiling. He has tetanus. And that is the sardonic smile. This is a baby who has the umbilical cord there was the entry site for tetanus. Total body opisthotness. This is the same kid who survived tetanus. So yes, you can survive tetanus. And then this was a gore from an animal, so that is a high tetanus-prone wound, of course. And then this guy here has tetanus, and you put him in a dark room, and you don't open the door. You don't turn the lights on, otherwise they go into spasms, any stimulation. So remember, tetanus is a big problem. A million cases, 50,000 deaths are in children. In the U.S., it's mostly the elderly because they don't get vaccinated. Heroin use is a big tetanus concern. It's a motor neuron synaptic problem. You get rid of the inhibitory neurons with the tetanus spasm. You get the lock jaw, the difficulty swallowing. Uh, sensory stimuli uh, tend to cause the spasm. And um, the neonatal tetanus is usually from the stump, putting junk around the stump or using bamboo to cut the cord. And then uh, it's a pure clinical diagnosis. You usually will not culture the tetanus out. And you want to give the immune globulin around the wound at least half of it, and the tetanus toxoid as well. And what people usually can have complications are broken bones, autonomic instability, laryngospasm, and respiratory failure. And then another thing you can get from traveling, of course, this one is college student to Costa Rica. That's Leshmania from the noceum sandfly. And you could see that in a nodular ulcerative phase from two types of sandflies, depending on where you are in the world. That's Leshmania mexicana uh, from Chicolero's ear. Likes to bite the ears. That's called Espundia. It likes the nose. Okay, Leshmania brasiliensis. And then, of course, visceral leshmania likes to give you a big liver spleen, involves the bone marrow. So those are the three types of leshmania you can see. Most of the cutaneous Central South America, Mediterranean, and Middle East. And you can see some countries have a lot of leshmania, more so than others when you start looking at maps of where is leshmania. This is Kayla Azar, leshmania done of Vanai. Interesting, there's association with dogs and humans living together, so that um, there may be some Leshmania uh, correlation there. And then visceral is Brazil, Sudan, India, and Bangladesh primarily. Uh, risk factor, contact with dogs, chickens, horses, and poor hygiene. All of these uh, may increase risk. And then bone marrow biopsy will ultimately show you the a mastigote in the bone marrow with the kinetoplast and the nucleus. As you can see here, kinetoplast nucleus, that's a Leishmania proven diagnosis. So remember the phlebotomous sandfly and the treatment is stibagluconate, ambisome, and azoles. And again, trying to prevent the bug bite biting you 
may prevent the Lesh mania. And then other things that are very common in other countries, more so in the U.S., is scabies. Likes the end step of the foot in the kids between the fingers, the breast area, the groin, the waist, antecubital fossa. So this is what scabies would look like. There's the bug, the egg, and the stool. And that's what it would look like under scanning an electron micrograph. Where does scabies like? And then with immune suppressed HIV cancer patients, that's Norwegian or crusted scabies. Very contagious. Crusted scabies. Very contagious. Billions of organisms. And then finally, head and neck infections. You see a lot of Parvo B19. There's an outbreak now around the world going on. Slap cheek. Uh, you can also see erysipelas, both here in the U.S. and abroad. It looks like lupus. Lupus spares the nasal labial fold. Erysipelas does not. So remember, erysipelas is the lupus look-alike. And then uh, if you're in contact with water anywhere in the world, even in our own state, with conjunctival hemorrhage and jaundice, with renal problems, you want to think of what? Leptospirosis. The bad one is icterohemorrhagicum. This one is enterogans. It doesn't just require rat urine. Any animal urine getting into the soil and into the water can give you leptospirosis, also known as Wiles disease. It's a worldwide problem, and it's a problem with adventure vacations. It survives in the kidney, excreting the urine for over six months, and ultimately it becomes a multi-system disease, almost like a vasculitis. The treatments are penicillin or doxycycline, up to 10% mortality with Wiles disease. And remember, you almost get a intravascular bleeding kind of vasculitis uh, pathology there. So uh, you can even get autoimmune uveitis from it, but the symptoms are very broad, including fevers and headaches, kidney disease, liver, uh, and then neurologic. There's a specific leptospirosis called Fort Bragg fever that occurred in an outbreak giving you some unusual constellation of symptoms and the diagnosis is by usually serology and of course clinical would be done first and then don't forget the penicillin or doxycycline for seven days and the mortality is usually low except for the Wiles disease and the liver renal dysfunction is a problem don't forget second most common infectious cause of blindness is onchocerciasis, river blindness. This guy's from Benin. And so you can see it's in Africa, Central South America, and the World Health Organization is trying to eradicate it. The most common cause of blindness worldwide is due to trachoma, okay? And this is what your eyelids would look like with trachoma. And eventually you cause trachiasis and the scarring pulls the hair down and it rubs against the eye. And this is where trachoma is very common globally. So how would you prevent trachoma? What which signs would you put up? How about this one? Wash your face, prevent trachoma. So it's spread by flies, not sexually transmitted disease. It's a different strain. So wash your face is the big push. Get the flies off. So remember, trachoma is one of the major causes of blindness uh, globally and giving the village azithromycin and coming back and giving it three to four months later can totally eradicate it from a village. Um, here's another thing that likes to crawl across your eye, a worm. So that's loa loa. There's the extraction of it, bitten by a black fly. And there's the loa loa filaria looking worm spread by that chrysops fly at the top, the bite. And that's what it would look like. And then finally, contact lenses. What are the three infections with contact lenses? There was an outbreak with Renew contamination. So this one is <coughs> Pseudomonas. That's the number one. Number two is, uh, that's still the Pseudomonas. Number two is this amoeba, which is called Acanthamoeba. And then number three, what's the fungus called? Fusarium, and the famous outbreak was Fusarium with contact lenses. So those are the three eye infections, Pseudomonas, Acanthamoeba, Fusarium. 
and then endophthalmitis, usually following eye surgery anywhere in the world, gram positives dominate, then a few gram negatives in yeast. And that's called what? Hypopion, pus in the eye, right? Hypopion. Thank you for your attention, and hopefully you'll be more familiar with infections in your travels.